love the idea of one-of-a-kind handmade items, but you've probably noticed they come with a higher price tag than their mass-produced contemporaries. Sometimes that turns us off, but we don't often think about all the work and the artistry that goes into making an item by hand. And these days, we're looking for that. I think we want that artistry. So joining us now to show us exactly what you pay for is Erin Williams. I love that we're talking about this, Erin. So this is something you're very passionate about. Tell us what we are getting when we buy handmade. When you buy handmade, you're not just buying a thing. You're buying a story, you're buying all of the hours of work that have gone into it to make that thing so beautiful that you're going to keep it as close to forever as it can get. And that's what I really love about it. It's not a disposable thing. There's some real artistry, some real story, and some real history behind it, which is great. We hear this all the time when we invest in small businesses. When you are investing in a small business, it's not just the business. You've got a whole community of people that are living off of that economy that you've created, and the same for handmade. It is quality. So I think more of us realizing the hard work that goes into these pieces um, are going to get us to accept and appreciate the prices that come with it. Let's start with artisan brooms, shall we? Let's do that for sure. So. The whole thing here is with Marie Kondo, we've seen that rise of homekeeping. We're seeing the rise of craft at the same time. So I want to talk about um, Amina Haswell and her company called Prairie Breeze from Manitoba. These are all handmade. They are almost too good to use. I could actually see one of these hanging beside a fireplace or even on an art wall, how fantastic that would look. But Tracy, do you actually know what these are made out of? I don't know. Straw? I don't know. So this is corn broom. So oh. Amina actually grows corn broom on her property. It grows like regular corn does, up to about 10 feet of height or even further than that. And she will harvest that, and it's the fronds and the tips that actually will make the broom. She now makes about 800 brooms a year in lots of different shapes and sizes. Plus, she travels around North America, also kind of collaborating with other broom makers. She teaches lessons. She sells kits. It's really great to see that she's keeping the craft alive. But I just love how you're really elevating an everyday project, everyday product. And also, I just love the colors that she uses, too. It makes them really, really special. But do you, I have another question for you. This is a real tricky one. Do you actually know what a broom maker is called? I have no idea. I didn't know a broom maker had actually <laughs> a title. What is a broom maker called? A broom maker is called a broom squire. So it's a lovely old English description that I totally love. And I think that's really great that, that that's been taken on by Amina for sure. Um, I want that title. That sounds very regal and royal. I, I want to be a broom squire. Okay, moving on to your passion project now. Let's talk a little bit about Handmade with Casa Cubista. Sure. So you know our story. Uh, the fun thing for us is our niece thinks that we're jug makers. So <laughs> the really fun thing about this is that we kind of are. It's a best-selling part of our collection. But you know how Casa Cabista started. We've talked about it before. We were on sabbatical, David and I. We started this project together. And now six years on, our collection is in over 100 stores around the world. Oh, my goodness. That is incredible. And, I mean, when you think about... The jugs, I understand why they are the top selling item. They are a vase, they are a canister, they are all the things you need them to be. They can just be a piece of your decor because they're so pretty. So uh, tell me more, a little bit more about the jugs. So the jugs themselves, you know, actually I would put sangria in them personally, but maybe that's just me. Um, but I have to tell you, that it's a multiple step process with actually making these things. Uh, the first thing is the body gets made by our potter, Rui. So Rui has been throwing on the wheel since the age of eight. His own family has a 200-year history with ceramics. So he's now in his 40s, and he makes it so easy to throw things on the wheel. But I can personally attest to my failures about how difficult that can be. So like I said, it's a multiple-step process. The body comes first. Then it's actually dried a little bit so he can work with it afterwards. Then it's the spout and the handle get attached. And isn't that crazy how it comes together? That really, it's all muscle memory, the way that these pieces are made, cut, and then attached through. You can see how that all comes together. Then out into the Portuguese sun, the pieces dry in the sun before being dipped in a liquid white clay. Then they go into the kiln for the first time. That's a thousand degree kiln for almost a day. I gotta tell you, unloading the kiln is not for the faint of heart. I always have to be careful whenever I'm doing it because I can actually melt my glasses. 
Oh my God. Finally, after that point, it's off to be painted. And uh, Rui's aunt Regina does all of the painting and she has a steady hand. She's so good at what she does. Um, finally, the pieces are dipped in glaze and they're fired and voila, that's how you make a jug. How many hours are we saying, uh, would you say that it takes to make one jug? You know, we're not going to measure it in hours. We're actually going to measure it in days. So wow. each jug takes at least three to four days because of the time in the sun and the time in the kiln. And i got to tell you, when the weather isn't cooperating, it's even longer. So rainy days slow everything down for us. Oh, my gosh, incredible. Can we talk a little bit about the craftsmanship of quilt making? Absolutely, let's do it. So the talent behind all these quilts, uh, the company's called Rocks Creative, and it's Naila Jansen. She's from Winnipeg. And she really views fabric and color the same way that an artist looks at paint and canvas. So her pieces are really inspired and this very special. She got into the whole uh, quilt making and patchwork uh, craft after about breast cancer, and it's been really therapeutic for her, and it's a fantastic vision to see her work really progress into that. So the thing for me is that quilting is that perfect combination between craft, art, and mathematics, plus you have to have a major attention to detail. So the added special ingredient in all of these pieces is that there's a story behind all of the capsule collections that she puts together. So this whole collection here is called Interconnected, and it's a beautiful tonal palette which really represents the power of humanity. And then we're also looking at storytelling through reinterpreting quilt history too. Nyla was inspired by quilt patterns of the Underground Railroad that signify safe haven. So it's really special to her to kind of bring these stories into these pieces as well. And a good quilt maker is always tested on how sharp their points are on their triangles. So that's really important. So to actually make a quilt, you patchwork the front face first, and then it's layered onto batting, add, uh, uh, backing is added, and it's edged and all stitched together. So what we're doing here is actually creating a secondary pattern when everything is stitched. So it really is pattern on pattern what you're getting. It's really fantastic. And I just love the play of colors and textures and all the detail that goes into these pieces. Listen, this is a major lesson. Like, I learned a lot right now. So thank you so much for shedding light on these artisans, uh, Aaron. Great job, great history there. For our viewers, you can scan the QR code you see on your screen right now to shop all of these beautiful pieces. You'll also find them and all of the details on our website.